Astronomical Models Astronomical models of the universe were proposed soon after astronomy began with the Babylonian astronomers, who viewed the universe as a flat disk floating in the ocean. And this forms the premise for early Greek maps, like those of Anaximander and Hecatius of Miletus. Later Greek philosophers observing the motions of the heavenly bodies were concerned with developing models of the universe based more profoundly on empirical evidence. The first coherent model was proposed by Eudoxus of Nidos. According to Aristotle's physical interpretation of the model, celestial spheres eternally rotate with uniform motion around a stationary Earth. Normal matter is entirely contained within the terrestrial sphere. This model was also refined by Callippus, and after concentric spheres were abandoned, it was brought into nearly perfect agreement with astronomical observations by Ptolemy. The success of such a model is largely due to the mathematical fact that any function, such as the position of a planet, can be decomposed into a set of circular functions. Other Greek scientists, such as the Pythagorean philosopher Philoleus, postulated that at the center of the universe was a, quote, central fire, end quote, around which the Earth, Sun, Moon, and planets revolved in a uniform circular motion. The Greek astronomer Aristarchus of Samos was the first known individual to propose a heliocentric model of the universe. Though the original text has been lost, a reference in Archimedes' book The Sand Reckoner describes Aristarchus' heliocentric theory. Archimedes wrote, quote, you, King Galon, are aware the universe is the name given by most astronomers to the sphere, the center of which is the center of the Earth, while its radius is equal to the straight line between the center of the Sun and the center of the Earth. This is the common account, as you have heard from astronomers. But Aristarchus has brought out a book consisting of certain hypotheses wherein it appears, as a consequence of the assumptions made, that the universe is many times greater than the universe just mentioned. His hypotheses are that the fixed stars and the sun remain unmoved, that the earth revolves about the sun on the circumference of a circle, the sun lying in the middle of the orbit, and that the sphere of fixed stars situated about the same center as the Sun, is so great that the circle in which he supposes the Earth to revolve bears such a proportion to the distance of the fixed stars as the center of the sphere bears to its surface." End quote. Aristarchus thus believed the stars to be very far away and saw this as the reason why there were no visible parallax that is, an observed movement of the stars relative to each other as the Earth moves around the Sun. The stars are in fact much farther away than the distance that was generally assumed in ancient times, which is why stellar parallax is only detectable with telescopes. The geocentric model consistent with planetary parallax was assumed to be an explanation for the unobservability of the parallel phenomenon, stellar parallax. The rejection of the heliocentric view was apparently quite strong, as the following passage from Plutarch suggests. Quote, Cleanthes thought it was the duty of the Greeks to indict Aristarchus of Samos on the charge of impiety for putting in motion the hearth of the universe, i.e. the earth, supposing the heaven to remain at rest and the earth to revolve in an oblique circle while it rotates at the same time about its own axis." End quote. 
The only other astronomer from antiquity known by name who supported Aristarchus's heliocentric model, Seleucus of Seleucia, a Hellenized Babylonian astronomer who lived a century after Aristarchus. According to Plutarch, Seleucus was the first to prove the heliocentric system through reasoning. Seleucus' arguments for a heliocentric theory were probably related to the phenomenon of tides. According to Strabo, Seleucus was the first to state that the tides are due to the attraction of the moon, and that the height of the tides depends on the moon's position relative to the sun. Alternatively, he may have proposed the heliocentric theory by determining the constants of a geometric model for the heliocentric theory, and by developing methods to compute planetary positions using this model, like what Nicholas Copernicus, like what Nicholas Copernicus did in the 16th century. During the Middle Ages, heliocentric models may have also been proposed by the Indian astronomer Aribata, and by the Persian astronomers Albumasar and al -Shizhi. The Aristotelian model was accepted in the Western world for roughly two millennia, until Copernicus revived Aristarchus' theory that the astronomical data could be explained more plausibly if the Earth rotated on its axis, and if the Sun were placed at the center of the universe. Quote, In the center rests the Sun, for who would place this lamp of a very beautiful temple in another or better place than this, wherefrom it can illuminate everything at the same time? As noted by Copernicus himself, the suggestion that the Earth rotates was very old, dating at least to Philylos, circa 450 B.C., Heraclitus Ponticus, circa 350 B.C., and Ecphantus the Pythagorean. Roughly a century before Copernicus, Christian scholar Nicholas of Cusa also proposed that the Earth rotates on its axis in the book On Learned Ignorance, 1440. Aryabhata, 476-550, Ramagupta, 598-668, and Albumasar and al sijzi also posed that the Earth rotates on its axis. The first empirical evidence for the Earth's rotation on its axis using the phenomenon of comets was given by Tusi, 1201-1274, and Ali Kursiji, 1403-1474. This cosmology was accepted by Isaac Newton, Christian Herens, and later scientists. Edmund Haley, 1720, and Jean-Philippe de Chisot, 1744, noted independently that the assumption of an infinite space filled uniformly with stars, would lead to the prediction that the nighttime sky would be as bright as the sun itself. This became known as Olber's paradox in the 19th century. Newton believed that an infinite space uniformly filled with matter would cause infinite forces and instabilities causing the matter to be crushed inwards under its own gravity. This instability was clarified in 1902 by the Jeans Instability, Jeans Instability Criterion. One solution to these paradoxes is the Charlier Universe, in which the matter is arranged hierarchically, that is, systems of orbiting bodies that are themselves orbiting in a larger system ad infinitum in a fractal way, such that the universe has a negligibly small overall density. Such a cosmological model had also been proposed earlier in 1761 by Johann Heinrich Lambert. A significant astronomical advance of the 18th century 
was the realization by Thomas Wright, Immanuel Kant, and others of nebulae. The modern era of physical cosmology began in 1917, when Albert Einstein first applied his general theory of relativity to model the structure and dynamics of the universe. Theoretical Models Of the four fundamental interactions, gravitation is dominant at cosmological length scales, that is, the other three forces are believed to play a negligible role in determining structures at the level of planets, stars, galaxies, and larger scale structures. Since all matter and energy gravitate, gravity's effects are cumulative. By contrast, the effects of positive and negative charges tend to cancel one another, making electromagnetism relatively insignificant on cosmological length scales. The remaining two interactions, the weak nuclear force and the strong nuclear force, decline very rapidly with distance. Their effects are confined mainly to subatomic length scales. General Theory of Relativity Given gravitation's predominance in shaping cosmological structures, accurate predictions of the universe's past and future require an accurate theory of gravitation. The best theory available is Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, which has passed all experimental tests hitherto. However, since rigorous experiments have not been carried out on cosmological length scales, general relativity could conceivably be inaccurate. Nevertheless, its cosmological predictions appear to be consistent with observations, so there is no compelling reason to adopt another theory. General relativity provides a set of ten nonlinear partial differential equations for the space-time metric that must be solved from the distribution of mass energy and momentum throughout the universe. Since these are unknown in exact detail, cosmological models have been based on the cosmological principle, which states that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. In effect, this principle asserts that the gravitational effects on the various galaxies making up the universe are equivalent to those of a fine dust distributed uniformly throughout the universe with the same average density. The assumption of a uniform dust makes it easy to solve Einstein's field equations and predict the past and future of the universe on cosmological timescales. Einstein's field equations include a cosmological constant that corresponds to an energy density of empty space. The cosmological constant can either be negative or slow the expansion of the universe, or be positive or accelerate the expansion of the universe. Though many scientists, including Einstein, had speculated that the cosmological constant was zero, recent astronomical observations of type 1a supernovae have detected a large amount of, quote, dark energy, end quote, that is accelerating the universe's expansion. Preliminary studies suggest that this dark energy corresponds to a positive cosmological constant, although alternative theories cannot be ruled out as yet. Russian physicist Zeldovich suggested that the cosmological constant is a measure of the zero-point energy associated with virtual particles of quantum field theory upper a pervasive vacuum energy that exists everywhere, even in empty space. Evidence for such zero-point energy is observed in the Casimir effect. 
special relativity and space-time. The universe has at least three spatial and one time or temporal dimension. It was long thought that the spatial and temporal dimensions were different in nature and independent of one another. However, according to the special theory of relativity, spatial and temporal separations are interconvertible within limits by changing one's motion. The analogy in space-time is called the interval between two events. An event is defined as a point in space-time, a specific position in space, and a specific moment in time. According to special relativity, one can change a spatial and time separation into another by changing one's reference frame as long as the change maintains the space-time interval. Such a change in reference frame corresponds to changing one's motion. In a moving frame, lengths and times are different from their counterparts in a stationary reference frame. The precise manner in which the coordinate and time differences change with motion is described by the Lorentz transformation. The distances between galaxies increase with time, but the distances between the stars within each galaxy stay roughly the same due to their gravitational interactions. Such a universe oscillates between a Big Bang and a Big Crunch. The Pythagorean theorem holds only on infinitesimal length scales and must be augmented with a more general metric tensor, which can vary from place to place, and which describes the local geometry in the particular coordinate system. However, assuming the cosmological principle that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic everywhere, every point in space is like every other point. Hence, the metric tensor must be the same everywhere. That leads to a single form for the metric tensor. This metric has only two undetermined parameters. An overall length scale, R, that can vary with time, and a curvature index, K, that can only be 0, 1, or negative 1, corresponding to flat Euclidean geometry, or spaces of positive or negative curvature. In cosmology, solving for the history of the universe is done by calculating the overall length scale as a function of time, given the curvature index and the value of the cosmological constant, which is a small parameter in Einstein's field equations. An overall length scale varies with time is known as the Friedman equation after its inventor. Alexander Friedman. Solutions for the Friedman equation can depend on the curvature index and the cosmological constant, but some qualitative features of such solutions are general. First, and most importantly, the length scale of the universe can remain constant only if the universe is perfectly isotropic with positive curvature. First and most importantly, the length scale of the universe can remain constant only if the universe is perfectly isotropic with a positive curvature and has one precise value of density everywhere, as first noted by Albert Einstein. However, this equilibrium is unstable, and since the universe is known to be inhomogeneous on smaller scales, the overall length scale must change according to general relativity. When the overall length scale changes, all the spatial distances in the universe change in tandem. There is an overall expansion or contraction of space itself. This accounts for the observation that galaxies appear to be flying apart. The space between them is stretching. 
The stretching of space also accounts for the apparent paradox that two galaxies can be 40 billion light years apart, although they started from the same point 13.7 billion years ago and never moved faster than the speed of light. Second, all solutions suggest that there was a gravitational singularity in the past when the overall length scale goes to zero and matter and energy become infinitely dense. It may seem that this conclusion is uncertain since it is based on the questionable assumptions of perfect homogeneity and isotropy, the cosmological principle, and that only the gravitational interaction is significant. However, the penrose hawking singularity theorems show that a singularity should exist for very general conditions. Hence, according to Einstein's field equations, the overall length scale grew rapidly from an imaginably hot, dense state that existed immediately following this singularity when the overall length scale had a small, finite value. This is the essence of the Big Bang model of the universe. A common misconception is that the Big Bang model predicts that matter and energy exploded from a single point in space and time. That is false. Rather, space itself was created in the Big Bang and imbued with a fixed amount of energy and matter distributed uniformly throughout. As space expands, the density of that matter and energy decreases. Third, the curvature index determines the sign of the mean spatial curvature of space-time averaged over length scales greater than a billion light years. If the curvature index is 1, the curvature is positive, and the universe has a finite volume. Such universes are often visualized as a three-dimensional sphere embedded in a four-dimensional space. Conversely, if the curvature index is zero or negative, the universe may have infinite volume depending on its overall topology. It may seem counterintuitive that an infinite and yet infinitely dense universe could be created in a single instant at the Big Bang when the length scale of the universe was zero, but exactly that is predicted mathematically when the curvature index does not equal one. For comparison, an infinite plane has a zero curvature, but infinite area, whereas an infinite cylinder is finite in one section, and a torsus is finite in both. A toroidal universe could behave like a normal universe with periodic boundary conditions, as seen in wraparound video games such as asteroids. A traveler crossing an outer boundary of space going outwards would reappear instantly at another point on the boundary moving inwards. The ultimate fate of the universe is still unknown because it depends critically on the curvature index and the cosmological constant. If the universe is sufficiently dense, then the curvature index equals 1, meaning that its average curvature throughout is positive and the universe will eventually re-collapse in a big crunch, possibly starting a new universe in a big bounce. Conversely, if the universe is insufficiently dense, the curvature index equals zero or negative one, and the universe will expand forever, cooling off and eventually becoming inhospitable for all life as the stars die and all matter coalesces into black holes. This is called the Big Freeze. 
As noted above, recent data suggests that the expansion speed of the universe is not decreasing as originally expected, but increasing. If this continues indefinitely, the universe will eventually rip itself to shreds. Experimentally, the universe has an overall density that is very close to the critical value between recollapse and eternal expansion. More careful astronomical observations are needed to resolve the question.